take a look now at the cell mediated response and in particular how the helper T cells and the cytotoxic T cells first get activated and how the process begins. And in the next video, we'll look at some of the details of how the cytotoxic T cells actually carry out their function. But right now what we need to do is we need to think about their activation, right? <clears throat> so um, let's distinguish the two populations. Helper T cells secrete cytokines, which are immune system signaling chemicals that are involved in essentially coordinating the entire response, both the B cell and the T cell response. And in this case, in the cell mediated immunity, we're going to see that cytotoxic T cells require cytokines from helper T cells before they can be activated. And then the role of the cytotoxic T cells is going to be to actually migrate from the, where they were first activated, someplace like a lymph node, <clears throat> to the site of the infection and destroy host cells, that's you and me, that have intracellular pathogens. That's really the whole purpose. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to think about T cells in general, but then we're going to look at how helper T cells get activated and then how they're involved in activating cytotoxic T cells. And in the next video, we'll look at what cytotoxic T cells actually do. All right, so what are T cells? These are lymphocytes. They are specialized white blood cells that orchestrate, if you will, the cell-mediated response. The helper T cells are the, the chemical signaling molecule producers, the cytokine producers, that essentially give the thumbs up to a variety of cells, including cytotoxic uh, T cells and the B cells, that they should move forward with their response. The cytotoxic T cells uh, are going to go to the site of the infection and kill infected host cells. These T cells begin their lives as pluripotent stem cells in the bone marrow. When the bone marrow pluripotent stem cells receive signaling molecules that say we need some T cells, those T cells begin to differentiate, but then they migrate to the thymus, hydrothymus organ. Hydrothymus, and you tap it with your left hand, so you know exactly what this is taking place. The thymus is where... Um, for T cells, where clonal deletion takes place. If you don't remember what clonal deletion is, go back to the last video, go back to your textbook, make sure you remember this. The thymus is where T cells get their name from, right? Because they undergo clonal deletion and this sort of final phase of maturation. There's my phone. Final phase of maturation within the thymus. From the thymus, then, <clears throat> they migrate to the lymphoid organ. So assume that they've survived clonal deletion in the thymus. They're going to migrate to the various lymphoid organs, take a look at figure two to see how that's happening, where they're just going to sit. And they're going to sit there and they're going to wait until they're exposed to antigen. The antigen is actually brought to them. Uh, and we're going to see that it's brought to them primarily by um, phagocytic white blood cells, like macrophages and, um, macrophages and uh, not basophils, what's the other one, neutrophils. Uh, or it's brought to them by dendritic cells. And then they're literally presented to them in that lymphoid organ before they begin their response. As a reminder, remember that the T cell receptors, their antigen binding sites are randomly generated. So each one is, has an affinity for a different antigen that's out there in the world, sort of like a puzzle piece that you cut by hand. And then you're just going around the world buying boxes of puzzles looking for the perfect fit. Uh, but in a sense, I guess we'd reverse that. All the puzzle pieces are coming to you, and you're simply testing to see if any of them matches your puzzle piece. And if you do get a match, then you're going to start an adaptive immune response against that. Because if you match it, it's clearly not self, because you, you, you survived clonal deletion, and therefore you don't have a puzzle piece against self antigen. Now, <clears throat> when, that, when it's exposed to antigen and you do get a good binding, uh, a response that takes place, presumably that's, that's non-self antigen, an adaptive immune response is, is desired against it, and that T cell gets activated. And what we mean by activated now is that it's, number one, going to proliferate. We're going to undergo clonal expansion, like we talked about in the last video. And number two, it's going to undergo differentiation, splitting into two pools, if you will, of T cells. The effector T cells are going to be involved in the current battle. This fight right now. Their lifespan is short. A couple weeks to a couple of months and then they'll die back. But there's going to be a small pool of them 
that are called memory T cells that are going to not get involved in this battle, but they're going to grow up a larger population, and they're going to have the exact same T cell receptor that was activated, and it's going to help you in a memory response, a secondary response. Those memory T cells are essential for our ability to not get infections again and again and again. If you get infected by a particular version of the flu virus, you're going to build up memory T helper cells and memory cytotoxic T cells. So that if you are ever exposed to that exact same flu virus again, you've got an army ready to go, and you're going to clear that infection before they, it ever begins, before it ever really establishes itself and begins to make you sick. So whether we're talking about helper T cells or cytotoxic T cells, we have effector T cells for the current battle and memory T cells for the secondary response. So here's how that cell-mediated immune response is initiated. It starts with antigen-presenting <clears throat> cells. We have antigen-presenting cells, or APCs. Dendritic cells are some of the most important. Uh, but it turns out that our macrophages and neutrophils can also present antigen. So how does that happen? Well, dendritic cells we know are constantly sampling um, microbes uh, or anything that gets into the extracellular spaces underneath the skin and in the, um, in the mucous membranes. And we know that we have macrophages and neutrophils that are going to the sites of what they think are battles. Now remember, we talked about the stages of phagocytosis, and we said that step five, elimination, is not always essential. In some cases, some of these, um, some of these antigen-presenting phagocytic cells, instead of eliminating all the pieces and parts after they've digested some foreign particle of some kind, they will actually present them. They'll display them on their surface like trophies. And what they do is they bind them to a protein we call MHC, Major Histocompatibility Complex. They bind it to MHC and then stick it on their surface. So a dendritic cell that's just gobbled up a couple uh, um, uh, cold virions, let's say they're rhinovirus virions, <clears throat> will randomly chop them up into a bunch of different fragments, maybe hundreds or thousands of different fragments, stick them onto these little MHC pedestals, and then wedge them into their membrane on display like little trophies. And so they'll be covered in hundreds or thousands of these little bits and pieces of that cold virus. Then they're going to crawl by amoeboid movement to a lymphatic duct, a lymph duct, slowly move through the lymphatic vessels to the closest lymphoid organ. Think about, for example, a, um, a lymph node. And then present all those bits and pieces to the helper T cells and the cytotoxic T cells that are sitting there. That's the first step. Now, if what it just gobbled up was actually self, there shouldn't be any T cells that have T cell receptors that will recognize self. Why is that? Well, because of clonal deletion. And so anything that does recognize it, it should be because it's non-self and therefore potentially poses a threat. That's the process of antigen presentation. Now, before a cytotoxic T cell can be activated, a helper T cell has to be activated. Now, the cytotoxic T cell might recognize an antigen presented on MHC, <clears throat> but it's just going to sit there. It can be bound to it, and it's not going to do anything until a helper T cell says, yes, I also recognize that, and it's bad, and we should go fight it. So you get interaction between a helper T cell's T cell receptor <clears throat> and the antigen that's being presented to it on an APC, an antigen-presenting cell, using its MHC protein to hold it up there. You can imagine like an arm holding a piece of, uh, of, of antigen out to be examined. <clears throat> when there's a positive interaction, there's good binding between those two puzzle pieces, the helper T cell will be activated and it's going to secrete cytokines, communication molecules, that can then activate the cytotoxic T cells. Now the cytotoxic T cells can't be activated by, by cytokine alone and they can't be activated by antigen presented to them alone. They have to have antigen presented to them in the presence of the cytokine from the helper T cell. That way there's a confirmation. That way before they run off and start attacking cells, they know for sure that not only did they recognize it, but a helper T cell also recognized those antigens. And you can have confidence then that you're moving forward and you're gonna kill something you should be killing, not, uh, not self. <clears throat>
here's a quick little uh, PowerPoint animation of how it should happen. So imagine this is your dendritic cell. You have to use your imagination, I know. And it's crawling its way through your lymph node right now with a bunch of antigen presented. So here's its MHC molecule holding a little bit of antigen. And of course, it wouldn't just be one. There'd be thousands of them, and all the antigens would be slightly different because the digestion process in the dendritic cell of the pathogen was pretty random. They're presenting them to all these different helper T cells. Remember, each helper T cell has a slightly different antigen binding site on the T cell receptor. Most of them will not recognize this antigen. If, however, one of them happens to recognize the antigen, that helper T cell starts secreting cytokines, communication molecules, <clears throat> that will do a couple things. Some of those cytokines will turn around and bind to receptors on that very same helper T cell and cause it to proliferate clonal expansion so that you have more of exactly that helper T cell with exactly that helper T cell receptor so you can continue to recognize that exact antigen during this battle. But then also differentiation takes place, right? If we go from this one helper T cell with its particular T cell receptor and we start dividing and we make thousands and tens of thousands and millions of these, a small pool of them will be set aside as memory helper T cells for future battles against that exact antigen. And the rest of them will be effector helper T cells that are going to be involved in coordinating the T cell response to this exact infection right here, right now for the next few weeks. When the doctor is feeling your lymph nodes to see if he thinks you're sick, he's looking for clonal expansion, uh, primarily of your helper T cells and your cytotoxic T cells, but we'll see also the B cells come this way now as well. <clears throat> Those cytokines are involved in activating cytotoxic T cells, which we'll look at in a minute as well as some B cells, but it happens a little differently with B cells. And then it turns out that some of the macrophages, remember we said macrophages wander um, in an immature state as monocytes. Some of these cytokines will actually trigger them to finish their development into aggressive, active, phagocytic macrophages. <clears throat> the final step in this sequence of, of, an, of activation, of initiation of a cell-mediated response, is that now the cytotoxic T cells can be activated. Now, a dendritic cell or some other antigen-presenting cell will present antigen on an MHC molecule also to the cytotoxic T cells. This is all happening at the same time. <clears throat> if the cytotoxic T cell recognizes that antigen and there is cytokine present from helper T cells who have also recognized that antigen, then and only then the cytotoxic T cells can be activated. All right, that was a lot of detail. Work your way through that a few times. Make sure it makes good sense to you. And in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens once a cytotoxic T cell has actually been activated.